This week on Capitol Report, March begins towards Election Day. Plus, a glimpse into the crystal ball at Connecticut's long-term economic outlook. Economic growth creates opportunities for everyone in our state. Johanna Hayes looking to keep momentum going and retain her seat in the 5th Congressional District. People are back to work. More jobs have been created. Will UConn roll over and wind up joining the Big 12 Conference? We love Husky! And the state sending a message when it comes to welcoming visitors to Connecticut. It's our own little love letter to the nutmeg state. Time to get to work. Nice to see you. Capital Report starts now. <laughs> Welcome to Capital Report. I am Tom Dutch. We are so glad you're spending part of the Sunday morning alongside the panel. Power panel, panel. We're all back, guys. It's good to be Guess back. Respect, the mayor of Bloomfield, Connecticut, Danielle Wong, back from the Democratic National oh, Convention. Yeah. A big party, huh? Oh, yeah. Big party. Uh, George Simmons, the coach, former Speaker of the House. Uh, season starts next week. It's next week, but I wasn't invited to uh, the DNC. This <laughs> grants Republican strategists. No price okay. for Republicans. Right? <laughs> and Johnny Mack is back, huh? I'm back, and the white pants are not in store. Okay. Oh, there you sweet. go, John. Right. Make Let's a stand. Guys. Hey, put the white pants Pants in storage, put McKinney's white bucks in storage, throw the <laughs> covers on the pool, pumpkin spices on the menu. Kitties are back at school. All this means one thing. Yep, officially election season, baby. We are less than two months out. The first Harris-Trump debate is Tuesday night, and the coming weeks will be filled with polls, pundits, and platitudes. Here in Connecticut, all the political stars came out last week at the Labor Day traditional party in Newtown. U.S. Senator Chris Murphy, the Murph was out there along with his Republican opponent, Matt Corey. Fifth District Congresswoman Johanna Hayes also in attendance. And her electric guitar-toting opponent, George Logan. On the state level, Republican Senator Tony Wong, he's everywhere, was on hand in his district along with challenger Rob Blanchard, best hair in Connecticut, who was there as well. This was more than just a parade. After this weekend, starting tomorrow, a lot of volunteers start to assemble. Campaign headquarters start to fill up. And people get out on the doors and start firing up the phones and reaching out to voters and sprint to the end. All right, guys, this is, this is the time of the year. The cap report, like, leans into it, McKinney. What are you thinking? Well, first of all, uh, I've walked that parade tons of times. It's all about it's, you, John, huh? <laughs> It is. Well, you got to give him his due. Because it is the best Labor Day parade in the state of Connecticut. It is the start of campaign season. You see all the candidates out there, I will admit, in all my times walking, I never saw someone walk down with an electric guitar playing uh, the music that George Logan was, so credit to him. Look, a big weekend to start out campaigns, state senate races, Tony Wong, Rob Blanchard, that's going to be a super close race. Michelle Qualo uh, running in Danbury against Julie Kushner could be a closer race mm -hmm. than people think, uh, but it's a great event, and you see all the 2026ers are, are going to be there as well. Yeah, what do you yeah, think? You, did. What do you, you, think saw, you did see all the 2026ers out there, but, you know, it is campaign season. Folks are ramping up. you got to get out there. you got to be seen. you got to tell your story, and you got to meet the people where they are, and that's just a big event that people look forward to, and, you know, so it was no surprise to me to see those people it, out there. It's a huge parade. It's the, the pinnacle of the campaign yeah. season sometimes. Uh, I remember marching in it with Jody Rell way back in 2006. It's all about you too. <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's a tradition, um, but I think to the point, you know, you, we've got some really close uh, races, particularly the legislative races. Yeah, I think the House is not going to be as many races that people are really looking at, but the Senate is very interesting. The Julie Kushner one, uh, John, that you mentioned interests me. Do you think it's going to be the charter school issue that really, because that's what I keep hearing coming out of Danbury. That is a big issue. It, it helped Rachel Cholesky, too, run, yes. win a state rep race. Um, I, I think the district's gotten a little bit better for Senator Kushner with some of the redistricting. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's going to be a very close race. And I do want to correct one thing I said. Seeing George Logan with a guitar is one of the greatest things I said. It's actually the second greatest thing. Watching Nancy Wyman walk that parade route in heels, and heels in this tall heels. was the greatest oh, thing yes. I've ever seen. Uh, 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 up in your area. McCory, yeah. yeah, so, you know, he came off strong uh, winning his Democratic uh, primary, so kudos and shout out to Senator McCory for getting back into that seat. And, you know, it's really um, a race to November, just making sure he continued to stay out there, understand the district, and really make sure that the issues are at the top forefront, like all the candidates. Going in down to Stanford, right? Nick Simmons, you have there. Well, that was yeah, so, um, no, go ahead, Coach. Yeah, I was, I was going to mention that race, because if you look at the, the other statewides, I think it's pretty much a, a snoozer. So Mur Murphy's not going to lose. Uh, maybe 
Corey gets some issues to the forefront that uh, Murphy has to address. But it really comes down to some of the Senate races. And the Fazio Simmons one is very intriguing. You have obviously the Simmons with the stronghold in the Stanford area and the Greenwich area, but you have Ryan Fazio who's done a pretty good job. So what's going to happen there and who's going to come out on top is probably the race I'm watching the closest. Liz, where's the Republican pickups? Look, I think that the opportunities we see from particularly in the Senate, and I think that the consequential races, to your point, about where the state goes yeah. lie in the outcome of the state Senate districts. I think the uh, Sean Mastriano running in uh, Martha Marks against Martha Marks, that is a race to watch. Obviously, Michelle Coelho uh, in Danbury is another pickup opportunity for Republicans in the state Senate. Obviously, there's a lot of concern about Senator Wong. Um, and Ryan Fazio, as well as um, I know there's a real race um, in Lisa Seminaris district in the 8th. So there are a lot of state yeah. Senate seats that are really in play uh, where you're seeing both uh, parties really get in there and start yeah, uh, and the, doing more. The challenge for Republicans is you're going to have Harris, you're going to have Murphy, mm -hmm. you're going to have Himes, or you're going to have somebody else winning. How do you stop that down ballot trend? Yeah. Right. Okay, so, hey, last week, the Connecticut Business and Industry Association, or CBIA for us political wonks like to call it, <laughs> released its 2024 survey of Connecticut businesses. The big takeaway, the cost of doing business in Connecticut is expensive. Yeah, no, you know what. Nearly 9 out of 10 survey feel that way, and there are other issues as well. Lack of affordable child care, lack of skilled applicants, jobs are available in Connecticut. That's not the problem. Filling these positions, now that's the problem. Watch this. The high cost of living is one of the top reasons why they can't fill their workforce needs, attracting people to Connecticut, keeping people in Connecticut. Um, and so that's really the sentiment we heard from the business community. Workforce continues to be the top challenge, as well as the regulatory climate in Connecticut. If we had 0% unemployment, we'd still have 30,000 job openings in Connecticut. Just don't have enough people. And so finding the people is really what the employers, the businesses are struggling with. They're willing to train the folks once they find them in their businesses. And so it's the whole pipeline. It's the pipeline from K through 12 system, a third of our uh, public high school students who graduate every year don't go on to two or four year college of the military. How do we get them connected in a pathway program to fill some of these open jobs? It's nice to see you on paper, Joe, but the results aren't surprising to all of us who follow this closely. They're not. And, you know, I famously made a, a, a quote early in my campaign that, look, manufacturing is dead in Connecticut. We need to move on. And, and, and I was dead wrong, and I'm still wrong this day. But he brings up an interesting point, and Chris is doing a great job with the CBIA and how he messages, both to internally and externally. But we have all this money that's coming with the revenue caps, the guardrails. I think both parties need to get around the table and see how we can transform Connecticut, change the training, give companies money to do their own training facilities, have it be one of those votes that go up on the board that's outside of everything else and enable the state to make huge investments in the training. Because they're absolutely right. I see signs everywhere I go looking for skilled uh, uh, machinists, looking for um, other jobs all over the place. What are we doing? We haven't adjusted enough. The trade schools are now out from under the Department of Education, but they need help standing that up. Our Technical schools are trying, but there's a bureaucracy there. Both parties need to get together, take some of that extra money, and put it into job training. Well, and Joe, I think the private sector can help with the trade schools yep. and the vote tech schools by partnering with them. We've done some, and you were part of that, doing some great work with our community colleges to get training mm -hmm. in the areas where it's needed. But we've been talking about these issues for a long time. The private sector has some resources and some ideas. I think government needs to adopt them and, and kind of work on a new paradigm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so as we mentioned, access to affordable child care, another big issue that needs to be addressed. As Trump said, health care is health care. Uh, take a listen to what Foxwood CEO Josh Guyot had to say about that. Child care is child care, right? Child care continues to be a challenge for us. We've been very creative in how we schedule and trying to be flexible with that and then giving some reimbursement for child care and trying to really look at new and creative ways where we can help support uh, families within the organization uh, build a career at Foxwoods. Then you have Kamala Harris talking about child care a lot. Yeah, absolutely. We're talking about child care all the way from the federal level, all the way down to the local level. And I attended the CBIA conference, and well, one of the biggest things that came out of the panel was the barriers to child care. People mm. are leaving the workforce to supplement uh, child care because it's expensive, and people are not going back to work because it's cheaper to stay at home to watch your kids rather than going back to work, commuting. And a lot of factors go into that. You know, one of the biggest takeaways that I uh, took away from the CBIA conference was uh, school 
school uh, student loans, student loan mm -hmm. forgiveness, student loan repayment. The first critical uh, years out of college, the first five years, uh, students have to make a critical decision on what pathway to the workforce that they want to take. And a lot of times they pick the pathway that gets to pay those student loans, that gets to you know pay for the child care issues that we have at home. So we have to talk about um, the holistic and the drivers into why people are not coming back to work and why we can't get a skilled workforce right here in Connecticut. We have to cultivate here in state, you know, and yes, we are doing a lot of looking out of state and bringing talent in, but, you know, we got to really get real So, Liz, not, not like a Republican or a Democratic issue. How do the Republicans take this issue? Well, it's not a, it's certainly not yeah. a partisan issue, and I think it's so critically important to our state and to our economy to address uh, health care and child care and housing for, for the workforce and to be able to, to recruit talent. But at its core, this is about cost. And the state of Connecticut has done everything humanly possible to make working here more expensive, to make employing people here m more expensive. It is cost prohibitive to uh, to have child care in this state, to employ child care employees, to to have to to go out and get child care. Mm -hmm. So when when you're making everything so much more expensive and you're not looking at this holistically, you're not going to come to a solution because all you're going to do is add to the tax burden, add to the cost of everything, which is inflation. And so Connecticut has suffered so much more so than any other state in this regard because of how expensive everything already is here. Yeah, yeah. there's an opportunity here though for the yeah. private sector. We have a lot of office space vacancy right if i were an employer mm -hmm. i would try to use some of that space to get a child care program mm -hmm. here. i'm going to be a employer of choice if i can provide on-site child Correct. care for my workers i love you john McKee. that's gotta perfect make it, gotta make it more affordable all right guys up next on Capitol report let's get back to the discussion about the fifth congressional district the ad machine picks up with <laughs> new spots from johanna hayes what she's saying to news eight's mike cerulli about the race against george logan when we get back do not go away nice job guys yeah, yeah. On Cap Report, we took a look at new political ads from the 5th Congressional District. Challenger George Logan this morning. It's incumbent Democrat Johanna Hayes who is highlighting her accomplishments in Washington with the help of a new ad and also the help of her husband. Take a look at this. Watch this. In the Hayes House, we're committed to service. I'm proud to say I've served in law enforcement for over 27 years. Johanna's a teacher, National Teacher of the Year, in fact. She's taken that commitment to Congress, fighting to keep guns out of schools, safe drinking water for our kids, and making investments in our communities. We can relate. Our family has been through the same thing yours has. That's why we need Johanna. News 8's political contributor, my pal Mike Cerulli, had an opportunity to speak with Johanna Hayes about the approach and what lies ahead over the next two months. Hey, Mike, this is Hayes' fourth campaign counting. Why, why, why is she running ads focused on her biography? Shouldn't everybody know her by now? <laughs> Good morning, Tom. You know, I think part of the answer to your question can be found in that adage that in politics, when you start feeling like you're repeating yourself, that's probably the point when the message starts to reach and sink in with the average voter. I mean, look, we live in a very fragmented media environment. Most people, most people, most normal people are not thinking about politics as much as you and I do, Tom. You know, maybe they've been tuned into the action at the top of the ballot, but as far as those down ballot races go, it probably doesn't hurt to remind folks uh, in the 5th District of the personal story of the person they've sent to Congress uh, since 2018. Like George Logan's uh, first ad was focused on inflation and a partisanship. Do you expect Hayes to kind of lean into those issues going forward? Yeah, I mean, we've still got a lot of ball game left to play here. You mentioned I had the chance to speak with the congressman recently, and that was the thing that I brought up first, this issue of rising costs and the economy more generally. Yes, we've lowered the cost of prescription drugs, which is a huge issue for many families. People are back to work. More jobs have been created. So when we talk about the economy, it's not just the price of, I don't know, school supplies or what in, is in the grocery stores. It's making sure people have living wages, which he voted against raising the minimum wage. It's making sure that people have affordable housing, that they can afford health care.
you can, you can see there, she really leans fully into the Biden-Harris record and broader economic philosophy, capping the price of insulin for many seniors, efforts to raise the minimum wage, protecting the Affordable Care Act. She's voted, uh, during the time 538 tracked these votes, she's voted 99% uh, with the Biden-Harris administration. It's a little different some, from some other uh, swing district Democrats. And I think she's going to continue uh, to lean into that record. Like you mentioned, uh, Kamala Harris, do you think uh, Harris, the top of the ticket, hurts or helps Hayes? Yeah, I mean, I don't have a crystal ball, uh, but I guess the conventional wisdom would say that the new Democratic momentum behind Harris could translate to strong turnout. And Hayes is an enthusiastic supporter of the vice president and of Governor Walls. Again, a little bit different than some of the swing district Democrats in our region. And more than that, she's also made it clear that the top of the ticket will be an issue in this race. There's a contrast between her vocal support for Harris and George Logan's efforts to distance himself from the typical Republican, the Trump Republican. And Hayes will certainly highlight that for all of Logan's positioning as a moderate, a Logan win could help keep the speaker's gavel in Mike Johnson's hands, which would make it easier for a potential second Trump administration to pass their policies, even if Logan himself opposes some of those policies. So that's the argument you can expect to hear from Hayes in the coming weeks, and I'm sure we'll see it on the airwaves, Tom. Newsday's political contributor, Mike's really breaking it all down. Mike, thanks as always. See you next week. Rumors are swirling about UConn and a possible jump to the Big 12 Conference. Are there politics involved? You bet. We'll dive into this next on Cap Report. The kid does a good job. Again, a whole lot of chat about the possibility of a UConn making a jump to the Big 12. The conference is looking to expand, but now there are reports those talks could be on hold to move to the Big 12. We'd have UConn leaving the Big East for what's arguably the best basketball conference in the nation, but of course, Big East purists can relax for now, but let's be real here. Any move to the Big 12 would be all about football, and the question is, Will UConn ever have the football chops to be an attractive addition to the Big 12, in case you haven't noticed? UConn football continues to, how we should put it, um, <clears throat> struggle on the field. 50-7 to seven loss to Maryland to start the season didn't do much to show that UConn belongs in a Power 5 football conference. For now, Coach Jim Morris says his team needs to do a little more th uh, than just win the respect of, of their fans. Watch this. I would say this, you know, the energy that people bring we feed off of, and yet we have, to, we have to earn that. We have to earn their energy. We have to earn more people coming in and embracing this program. And I think if, if we can go out this year and show continued improvement and be very competitive and have a record that gets us into a, a good bowl, right, that, that I know that people will, will show up. So, Coach, you were shaking your head about, about, joining, about, about the football program. You know, we're a basketball state, and people want to be in the Big East. They don't want to play, you know, Tulane, right? So, but football's never going to be a powerhouse. Yeah, it, they're always going to struggle. They are running a Power 5 athletic department on a non-Power 5 budget, which is why we have those deficits year in and year out. And I'll give Coach Moore all the credit. He came into Connecticut. He embraced Connecticut, the high school coaches. We have two Connecticut kids starting in the backfield with both Rosa and uh, Cam. So, He's doing the right things, but it comes down to more the coach, the facilities. We have that all. It, it's not the X's and O's. It's the John's and the Joe's. And we're never going to get the kind of talent in here unless we change everything. And it's not just the conference. If we were to go into a power conference now, we are looking at, you know, two and eight seasons. And it, we're not going to make it to bowl games. The question is, for the powers that be and the state as a whole, the speakers weighed in, the governors weighed in, are we willing to sacrifice basketball for football? And if we're not, then let's just change football to something other than what it currently is and move forward with where we're at. We cannot afford to keep running a Power 5 conference on a non-Power 5 budget. Look, I'm going to say this, and I've said this uh, most of the times we've talked about this issue. This is Dick Blumenthal's fault. When you go back and you look at the consequence of that lawsuit in 2003 and what that has continued to do to this athletic department, it is criminal. And so we really need to take a look at that 
because that that is where, how we ended up where we are. Mm -hmm. It has to be part of the conversation. Yeah, you're, you're talking about you know a 56 million dollar bailout, right? So that cannot be you know ignored. And where did the supplemental you know how do you supplement for that deficit? You kind of take it from campus fees, you take it from student fees. Is that sustainable? Is that right? We'll see, right? And so I agree with the coach. You know, it's going to come down to you know what do we want to do? Do we want to be a basketball uh, community? Do you want to be a basketball state, or do we want to push the football piece? And football really has struggled to get up on its feet. Or be known for academics and research. <laughs> well, well, which we Why? should be. But, but the, the, the problem is that football is king when it comes to money. And you need money to run an athletic program large. The UConn athletic program, women's field hockey, women's soccer, women's softball, are national championship contenders. The men in baseball exceed all expectations. Mm -hmm. It's a great program except for football. College athletics is never going to change unless football is taken away from the NCAA. Everybody goes back to the regional conferences and football just becomes a secondary professional football league. All right, guys. Bingo. There you go. Has Connecticut gone too far when it comes to showing its pride? We're starting to see some signs. Literally, the story when California returns. How's <laughs> <laughs> that for cost? Yeah. Wow. Right, huh? I Close love it. That's That's pretty nice good. Song. All right. <laughs>